Colorado. Yes, please, gentlemen. Governor, does Colorado State mentor? Sorry, let us know Governor, who you are, please. My name is Dan Silverstein. I'm a private sector and capital markets consultant. Does yeah. Colorado State mentor universities in the areas in the regions in which they uh, innovate these various um, devices? No, I, I don't think there's like a university university mentoring program. There's a lot of shared research that happens. Um, we're the work that we're doing on methane leakage along the value chain of natural gas is all shared research that our partnerships that we're doing with other universities. But I don't think we particularly mentor other folks. Um, we have done actually. You know, it's kind of interesting to be invited from Colorado State to go to Princeton, to talk to people at Princeton about energy policy. I co-locate with engineers. So I'm a policy wonk with a law degree, and yet I'm situated with our water, our, um, our uh, mechanical engineers, our engines lab. We're all together because we think there's this big link, and we brought in behavioral sciences. So this isn't a direct answer to your question, but I'm just saying one of the things that I've done with other universities is talk about the need to have social scientists as a part of an engineering system mm -hmm. because of what I think who earlier talked about culturally, mm -hmm. cu cultural sound or culturally sound uh, technologies. You have to have it as a part of it. And so we really do do that. And we've been able to tell some other universities about how and why we're doing that part of it. Thank you. Any other questions in the audience? Yes, Mark. Uh, do you see any, given the gridlock, do you see any chance that, uh, that a carbon tax could get through in the U.S., even say a revenue neutral carbon tax, which would take away some of the ideological opposition to it at least, or is that still hopeless? So I'm on this panel for the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, we're about to go to peer review through the National Academy, so we're pretty much done. But, and we operate under Chatham House rules. We've debated this in a really big way. So I'll just tell you that I, um, let, me, let me say this is my opinion, not the opinion of the National Academy. But I have been a part of a discussion for the last year, and I don't think anybody sees a way over the next couple of years that anything passes Congress that puts some kind of a price on carbon. There's ways to do it. You can do it through fees. You can do it through taxes. And you can actually also set up cap and trade programs to do it. The interesting and fascinating thing about this is the EPA's uh, clean power plan Actually, if you look at the discussions happening in regions around the country, I think there is some possibility that that plan actually generates activity around regional trading. Maybe not, uh, but there is the possibility there are states that have made big bets on coal. They have more useful life for their uh, coal-fired generation. They want to keep as much of that useful life in place as they can, and those states actually could benefit from some type of a trading program. Their carbon stays in place, or their, their uh, fossil fuel generation stays in place, but they're trading credits out. California, the governor just announced he wants to go to 50% renewable energy. Right now, California is way ahead, sort of in the ability to trade credits uh, would benefit California, but it benefit these other states that uh, don't want to shut down their generation. So while the United States Congress may not be able to get there politically over the next couple of years, and maybe even beyond that, Although there is a growing, there's a growing um, narrative by people who are both, I think, Republican and conservative about the benefits of, a, uh, of pricing carbon, even though Congress may not be able to get there, we see opportunities for states to actually kind of do this on a regional basis and actually accomplish the same thing. Yeah, I see Tim. There, yes, Tim. please. With Tim Mealy with the Meridian Institute. So this is a panel, this is a question for anybody on the panel. Um, Everyone was, I think, duly impressed with President Obama's uh, China deal and the importance that you know China and the U.S. played was sort of emphasized in the governor's remarks. If you were advising Governor Obama as to how to continue to pursue the positive I interactions that happened with with uh, India recently, what would be the most important uh, kind of agreements that could be reached between the U.S. and India to take into Paris to help keep the momentum going? If there particularly as it relates to the water, energy, agriculture nexus. I'd like to take that. I want to take it first. Start. Get off. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll, I'll have something a little later, but let me just... Dangerous question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, uh, we're just trying to think what's ne when, when's the next time I go to India. 
the major difficulty we have with India these days is that they don't want to have any discussion about mitigation from agriculture. Uh, and yet, uh, they are a major producer and a major emitter from agriculture. I don't remember the figures, but I saw the, figure last, the figures last year. Uh, and, uh, and that's why I think the French government wants to push to have agriculture somewhere on the table, because we know that if we could reach agreements on agriculture as well with such countries, we would, uh, it would be a big, a big step ahead. It's not only about coal and, 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 and oil, it's, it's also about uh, uh, agriculture with those large producing countries. Do Just really quickly, you know, big issues in India, obviously a huge population, a growing economy uh, is going to need energy, and they've been searching for energy sources uh, to sustain them, uh, looking at even, you know, uh, bringing energy from Central Asia across Afghanistan, Pakistan. That, you know, is hopefully someday uh, we'll see that. But with in India itself, we are already engaging with them on uh, renewable energy as a you know going forward on a, on a, at scale, uh, not the small stuff, but really uh, big scale uh, uh, solar and, and other forms of renewable energy. And I think that is where we have an opportunity to uh, work with India uh, between the technology and uh, and you know the the needs of the country and so forth to to make a difference. Uh, it's also bringing in the private sector and making sure that we're getting private investment to uh, make those large-scale investments work. So, uh, anyway, that's a, a quick thought on that. Do we have any more in-house? Yes, please. And then we're going to go to, I'm sorry, there's just gentlemen. First, your question, please. And then the gentleman over there. Sorry, Kevin. I'm back over there. And then, and then we're going to stop on the in type. We're going to, if we have anybody online, we need to probably direct that after these two questions also, please. Thank you. Okay, uh, Brian Bruns, a consulting sociologist who works on uh, participation in irrigation and water management. Um, Claudia mentioned the food price shocks that fed through, to the energy price shocks that fed through to food prices and food security. And just curious if you have any questions right now, in a sense we're in the other kind of shock with cheap oil um, and at least on some optimistic scenarios, some things like uh, solar power, photovoltaic, solar pumping, which could have radical and disruptive implications for energy costs in agriculture in an opposite direction from the pessimistic kind of scenarios that we tend to be preoccupied with. So whether you have any questions kind of in the sense of a research agenda and understanding the resilience and opportunities in this linkages of you know, food, water, and agriculture in terms of you know, cheap energy, either now or technoli technologically driven in the future. Let's take the other question also too, please, and then we'll go back to answers, okay? Just to make sure we cover everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Asif Sheikh, Paxterra. Um, thank you for a great discussion. You've talked about the uh, uh, the ecosystem that comes around when you have a technology like cell phones. And that's generally true for technologies. They spread if they meet the criteria laid out of being commercially and economically and technically viable. But what about changes in practices uh, where large numbers of people, not just through a technology, have to change what they have been doing, sometimes for centuries? <coughs> How do you see going about that and getting traction and getting to scale? Because that has often been a very, very difficult thing in development. So I appreciate your thoughts. First question, do you want to? Hmm? Yeah. So just very quickly, I mean, of course, the lower energy prices right now are a boon for agriculture, economic development, et cetera. So that is very good. But the danger is that now people who have started to invest in you know, improving energy efficiency or like this nitrogen, uh, fertilizer use efficiency, et cetera, that they again say it's not worthwhile. You know, it's not worthwhile my investment costs because costs have gone down again. And so basically when we saw these energy price shocks, we've actually seen you know, new investment. It's the first time that the fertilizer 
industry association has been thinking about, you know, that maybe we should do something for improving efficiency in, in our production processes. So it goes both ways. So of course, uh, you know, for future food security and then to protect the most vulnerable and, and to increase access to energy, we do want to see those lower energy prices. So that's certainly good. Um, but then the question is, where do those developments go? I mean, will it be solar? Uh, or will it be, you know, let's, let's, everyone keeps finding coal nowadays in, in their countries. Or will it be, okay, let's just exploit all the natural coal that we have. And so, so again, the climate agreement, um, and also obviously the SDGs that are supposed to come online very soon, that also will have a, a lot of uh, monitoring and indicators and targets. So, you know, how countries will um, take them up, implement them, take them seriously will, I think, be very decisive and, and how we are going to meet all these goals on the climate mitigation side, ac access to energy for everyone, access to water, you know, everyone, ending hunger, etc. So, so I think there's a huge opportunity of things going in the right direction. But, I, but for example, I can't see that any of these uh, fossil fuel subsidies, you know, have gone out of business just because now energy prices are lower. I mean, I, I see we still even get the transportation surcharges everywhere, you know. Uh, even so, I guess the gasoline price hasn't, has, is not that high anymore. So it's very difficult to get out of um, a way of business. And, and one of the best ways of changing your business is if, if you have a shock that goes in the you know, in, in the bad direction. So, so yeah, I, I think there's a, a lot of opportunity, but to be seen. And I think uh, countries, if they do sign up to, to, if we get a good agreement in Paris, um, if, if countries are serious about the SDGs, so that there is some, um, you know, some potential improvement out there, but it's really to be seen. The scaling. See what? Practice. Um, the price signals, like I think, dropping some of those subsidies that were mentioned in terms of if you want people to conserve or you know, be more mindful of how they use energy, dropping the price subsidies could, w would be one way. Of course, it's better to have them an alternative available to them. So the technology has to be also there to provide them an alternative to switching. I mean, usually in conservation situations like in water, I mean, the household sector usually cuts back fairly well. I mean, even in this country, whenever there's a drought and people are asked to stop washing their cars or the, the, the household, the, the residential sector usually cuts back. It's usually the ag sector that has a hard time in terms of really changing their, ag, their, their practices. And, and maybe then there's a whole set of policy and instruments that would need to come into place there. But I think um, um, it's a combination of both the technology being available, available and the right price signals and policies being in, in most states with big agricultural sectors, there are somewhere around 80 to 85 percent of the water consumed is in agriculture. Um, and everything else, this is in the West, and Colorado is a great example. Um, so the Denver Water Board, because of a drought, said to consumers, reduce your water usage by 20%, and we did, and we've never gone back. It's never increased mm -hmm. again, but that's 20% of 15%, so it was 3% of all the consumed water in the agricultural sector. University of Denver looked at this issue about water in the West and came to this same conclusion that the agricultural sector actually uh, needs to have a conservation ethic that it doesn't currently have. And many places in the West, you actually have a use or lose mentality that disincentivizes it. So um, uh, you're back to thinking about policy as it relates to this issue of of water and water conservation. Excellent. And actually, we were going to let you go early because of needing to get to your next speaking engagement. I've given another speech. So what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's actually a perfect opportunity to thank you for well, thank coming you. and for fitting us into a very busy schedule. And uh, we hope that you come back again to IFPRI and to conversations with USAID and our other partners. We appreciate that. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you all. Thank you. I okay. appreciate it. And were there other questions online, Gwendolyn? <coughs> Was there no other questions online? Okay, and did we miss anybody else in the audience? There's one behind the... What, was there one? Because yeah, we can just take one more. We've got, the governor needs to run out, but if we, if we had one more question we didn't get to. Yeah, uh, me is Alam Mondol, actually. Not a question, <coughs> uh, kind of comments or something. Uh, we know about the energy security things, uh, food security issues. We know limited uh, energy resources. Uh, we have, and also we know the only sustainable ways are uh, renewable energy technologies or advanced clean technologies or energy efficiency improvement or uh, demand or supply side management to minimize the energy use or sort of things. But we also knew, uh, know the rate of uh, develop, development trend is renewables is also 
uh, very good only in developed countries. Developing countries is not like that. Ten years back, the per watt uh, solar panels cost was more than ten dollars. Nowadays, it's less than a dollar. But uh, my question is why the developing countries for uh, agricultural development or irrigation or some other purposes, why uh, the growth is uh, not scaling up? And what are the barriers, how to overcome? What are the policies to be implemented? Uh, so this is my main concerns and how to overcome and how to actually is need to scaling up the uh, clean technologies in rural areas, decentralized, maybe in hybrid or uh, small scale um, standby system. But even some studies found that this is economically vi viable, even solar wind nowadays, based on cost is decreased and efficiency has increased. So what is the reason why it is not scaling up? Developed countries, their uh, growth rate is relatively high. So my question is, which, which type of policy can be uh, shows or to be implicated to uh, more development of renewable energy technologies, or especially for energy efficient system in the, uh, developing countries. That'll be our last one that we take. Which one would like to take? Go ahead. address you on? I guess it would be probably a combination of things. Uh, willingness to pay for the ability to pay in some cases for the technology, depending on at what price it's, it, it's, it's available at, would, could be one issue. If perhaps a technology, again, if you sift through the graveyard, graveyard of good ideas that have gone to die <laughs> in, in, in the developed world, partly it may not, there may not have been that support from, it doesn't have to be the informal sector, but there, in, in order to reach those people, you need some, a different kind of a distribution system and a support system than what you, what you might find in a developing country context. And we know that when you have, I mentioned the question of population density, I mean, I know it's the same probably for um, energy as it would be for, for roads. You need four times as much roads to connect the same number of people in sub-Saharan Africa on average as you would, let's say, South Asia. So it's probably going to be the same for electricity. And so you're going to have to rely on decentralized systems, a different model for getting those same things out to the, to the same number of people. Um, but I, maybe we can have some on offline conversations about that. Great. And with that, we'd like to thank Charles, Claudia, Alan, Siwa. Thank you very much for coming and being with us. And I think uh, what we're hoping is we've started a conversation in, in an area where we can continue to think about um, working across the sectors, working and deepening policy partnerships and our ability to look into new areas innovatively and how do we share that together. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you.